If you've been to San Jacinto Battlefield since 1948, then odds are you had a chance to tour one of the few remaining battleships that served in both World Wars, the USS Texas. The Texas during the Second World War played a significant part in developing the still embryonic strategy and doctrine of amphibious assault. Military technology had advanced rapidly between the World Wars, but it would take years to figure out how to best use that technology. And while the Texas herself was decidedly an older technology, the use of ships as fire support platforms and their role in amphibious landings was, well, still to be determined. The USS Texas went into service in 1914, and yet in 1942 still had many years of service ahead of her when she was made part of the massive fleet that was sent to support the amphibious landings in North Africa of Operation Torch. And from there on, Texas would be a central part of one of the largest and most significant developments in doctrine that occurred over the course of the Second World War. It is history that deserves to be remembered. The Texas was first launched in May of 1912. She participated in normal fleet operations in her early years and had a role in rescuing passengers from a damaged Hull and America Line ship. Texas became the first U.S. battleship to install anti-aircraft guns in 1916, as well as the first to use directors and rangefinders to control gunfire, predecessors to modern computers. She served in World War I with the British Grand Fleet, prepared to fight the German High Seas Fleet if the Germans intended to engage the Allied Fleet. When World War II began in 1939, she participated in neutrality patrols, meant to keep the war out of the Western Hemisphere, and later escorted Lindley ships across the Atlantic. The Texas had been modernized in the interwar years and further upgraded with new anti-aircraft guns after the attack at Pearl Harbor. Until 1942, the Texas served mostly as a convoy escort, accompanying ships and units as far as Panama and Sierra Leone. Meanwhile, Europe was waiting impatiently for significant American forces to join the war. Joseph Stalin and the Soviet Union were desperate for a second front to alleviate combat on the Eastern Front, but the Allies had disagreements over what the best option was. Several high-ranking Americans were against the landings in North Africa, but ultimately President Roosevelt directly ordered that an attack on North Africa be made as soon as possible. The plan that formed was called Operation Torch, led by American General Dwight Eisenhower. The plan was to coordinate three landings in Vichy French territory in Vichy-held Morocco and Algeria, and to move quickly to secure Tunisia. Intelligence work suggested that Vichy French forces would not offer significant resistance to American landings. The Texas was ordered to join and serve as the flagship of Task Group 34.8, the Northern Attack Group for the Western Landings. The Task Group was assigned to attack Port Laite in French Morocco. It left Norfolk at the end of October. Aboard the ship was a 27-year-old working as a war correspondent for the United Press named Walter Cronkite. One of Texas's job was to be the base for a radio station called Clandestine Radio Maroc to broadcast propaganda aimed at convincing the French to desert the Axis and support the Allied invasion. Port Laite was home to a large French arsenal, as well as the site of an airbase. The Texas was part of the Western Attack Group for Operation Torch, which was in turn split into three different attack groups, one at Safi, one at Fidala, and one at Port Laite. Two other task forces were striking elsewhere on the North Africa coast, with the center force attacking Iran, Morocco, and the eastern attacking Algiers in French Algeria. In all, over 100,000 American and British troops would be involved in the assaults, along with hundreds of ships and aircraft. The attack at Port Laite was given the operational name Goalpost, with the primary objective of securing two airfields, one near Laite and another 25 miles south. The Allies had gained information about the situation in French Africa by several avenues, including the Polish-led Agency Africa and the relatively large number of American diplomats who remained in the region, especially Robert Daniel Murphy, who was the American consul in Algiers. They found support from Vichy commanders and officers who promised to assist in the Allied landings. In fact, French resistance staged a successful coup in Algiers. On the night of November 7th, just before the arrival of the fleet, pro-Allied French General Antoine Bentoir attempted a coup against the Vichy command in Morocco, even surrounding the resident general's villa. Pro-Vichy forces were able to defeat the coup attempt, however, and the attack alerted French defenses in Morocco to be on high alert. Bentoir was arrested by Vichy forces three days later. Before midnight on November 7th, Texas and Task Group 34.8 arrived at their objective off the Moroccan coast. H hour of the landings was delayed from 4 to 4.30 due to confusion among the landing boats. By then, speeches by President Roosevelt had already been broadcast from London, and combined with the failed coup, any hope for surprise had been lost. Only a small part of the force was able to disembark before dawn, 
shoreline was however lightly defended as few as 70 soldiers occupied the Kasbah for 12 kilometers from the city. The defenders did have some heavy weaponry, however, including two 5-inch guns near the Kasbah, as well as a half dozen 75mm guns. The Texas took position to the north of the landing zone, while the light cruiser Savannah was stationed south of the zone. In stark contrast to later amphibious assaults, there was no naval fire support before landing. The U.S. command wanted to maintain surprise and still hoped that the Vichy forces would support the Allies and offer little resistance. Unfortunately, the French commander had no orders to cooperate and felt honor-bound to fight. The landing complicated as troopways failed to land on the right beaches and as they quickly fell behind the timeline for the attack. The Texas had been ready to provide fire support if the ground teams found resistance too stiff at the Casbah, but never received the call for the attack, likely because by the night of the first day the landing team still held only precarious ground far from their objectives. During the afternoon on the first day, the Army did request fire at a munitions dump near the city. The first time that the ship, launched three decades earlier, would fire its guns in anger. To hit her targets, Texas was helped both by a spotting team on the beach and more often by her own spotting planes. Texas had several planes that were launched from the deck using a catapult. Cronkite launched in one and described it as as close to being shot out of a cannon as one could arrange without joining in the circus. The ship fired 59 14-inch rounds before the shore party signaled for cease fire. The pilot reported to the ship that 20% of the projectiles fired had hit in the target area. Cronkite reported that the firing was frightening to the uninitiated. It made the ship shudder so much so that it shattered some of the ceramic fixtures in the bathrooms and even burst some pipes. It wrecked the ship's public address system and knocked out the equipment for the unfortunate crew of Radio Clandestine Maroc. The ground forces were much more successful on the following day, advancing slowly towards their objectives despite greater than expected resistance. The Texas remained at hand but was not called on for fire support. It was the following day that the ship would see the most action. Early on the 10th, the Army requested fire support to delay or halt French troop movements along a major road. The ship made two bombardments, first to halt the traffic and again when the spotting plane reported traffic had begun moving again. The ship's planes also supported the landing with several attacks on enemy troops. At one point, one of the pilots actually pulled his sidearm out to fire at an enemy column. The same day, ground forces captured the Casbah. These and other advances led to a truce on November 11th. In all, Texas had fired 273 rounds of the 14-inch rounds and just six of the 5-inch in three bombardments. After the battle, Cronkite and a sailor went ashore to assess the ship's accuracy, traveling to the munitions dump that they had targeted on the 8th. The road leading to the dump was heavily pitted, but to their wonder, the dump itself was nearly untouched. A French veteran of the First World War and attendant at the arsenal greeted them as they passed through the gate, saying, Never have I seen such shooting. You cut every road leading to the arsenal and not one shell inside to do any damage. You have left it intact for yourselves. My congratulations. The sailor, knowing that the goal had been to destroy the dump, was likely less impressed. The battle report read slightly better. The firing had destroyed one of the dump's magazines and damaged two other buildings. In stark contrast to nearly all later amphibious operations, Texas and other ships involved in supporting the landing did so sparingly. In the Pacific, bombardments on island fortifications could last for weeks. The Pacific was a different kind of theater, though, one where the enemy expected to be attacked and there was no need for surprise, like in North Africa. But even compared to other European operations, the landing at Point Laite stands out. The Texas would fire 445 14-inch shells on June 6, 1944, in support of the landing at Omaha Beach. And it was only one of seven battleships at that landing. The Nevada fired nearly 2,700 5-inch rounds at Utah Beach. The Texas service at D-Day exemplified some of the changes in shore bombardment doctrine. To better assist the soldiers attempting to make a break through the D-1 exit for Omaha Beach, Texas closed in to about 2,800 yards of the beach to help clear the way out. This was at a range which threatened to ground the ship, as some destroyers were about a thousand yards out. The ship was so close that in this photo you can see the church steeple in the town of Erval-sur-Mar. In 1942, the U.S. Army was almost completely unprepared for the difficulties of an amphibious operation. The largest modern amphibious landing before World War II was at Gallipoli in World War I, which had been a general disaster. The U.S. had essentially no experience landing on an opposed beach, and preparing doctrine for a landing was difficult. They only had a short time to train, but the Army and the Navy had disagreements over who should be in charge and of what. 
The Marines and the Navy had worked out plans for what would happen in an island hopping campaign in the Pacific against Japan called War Plan Orange, and their thoughts and amphibious operations were put together in the Marines' tentative manual for landing operations in 1934, the core of which informed the Navy's landing operations doctrine in 1938. Though the need was known, the U.S. struggled to properly train, organize, or structure amphibious teams, and the attack on Pearl Harbor distracted the Navy from building landing craft. Eisenhower, who commanded Operation Torch, wrote that as late as February 1942, leadership was concerned about landing craft, and that, at the time, the Navy was only concerned with restoring the fleet. They were not particularly interested in building landing craft for future offensives. But if we didn't start building, we would never attack. The Army and Navy both jostled for control and responsibility over amphibious operations, with the additional interest of the Marines, who would shoulder so much of the job. Joint operation manuals that meant to solve these issues were complicated by vague sections and the realities of war. Eventually the Navy was given control of the landing while the Army took over after the troops had landed, which was largely in line with the guidelines in the Interwar Operations Guides. The guides did consider naval fire support, prioritizing the neutralization or destruction of coastal batteries and artillery. Understanding how much fire that would require and the best ways to use it wasn't fully understood until contact with the enemy, and the torch landing served as a lesson in what future landings would require. One of the lessons was understanding accuracy, as evidenced by the Texas's bombardment of the munitions dump. At the same time, the effectiveness of naval fire in disrupting enemy movements and reinforcements was proven by the bombardments on the 10th. Fire saturation was perhaps the greatest lesson learned, especially before the advent of more robust fire control systems. The Allies had good reasons to be anxious about the results of the landings, even against the relatively lightly defended African coast. Even on the eve of the invasion, there were serious concerns tests on the U.S. coast did not go well. In one, only one landing craft hit its target, while the rest ended up scattered along the shore, presaging the confusion that haunted the landings at Point Laite. At least one ship captain had to be convinced to sail, despite what he saw as an appalling lack of training for the operation. Despite that, the operation was a success, if the landing's imperfect. The landing had proved that the Army and Navy could successfully command a landing under a unified command, which would be useful in later landings, like against Sicily in July of 1943, and culminating in the much larger operation at Normandy. At Normandy, destroyers would provide near-shore support for the shore landing, in addition to aerial bombings and the battleships which could fire at targets miles inland. One British officer said that every grain of sand will be turned over twice before the first wave hits the beach. Operation Torch and the landings at Point Laite were a dress rehearsal of sorts for the later landings that would occur in Europe. They were a baptism by fire that represented a culmination of years of rivalry over command and confusion over what a large amphibious operation might look like. And despite the rather obvious failings that were obvious both before and after the landings in Africa, the Allies put those lessons into practice very quickly and developed much more successful doctrine for amphibious operations. Those were frankly some of the most important lessons learned in the early war that contributed greatly to successes like Operation Overlord, which was arguably one of the most important operations of the war. And USS Texas was central in learning those lessons. Older battleships like Texas served as essential fire support platforms for amphibious landings throughout the war, and Texas was there for some of the most important ones. Operation Torch, Operation Overlord, Operation Dragoon, the invasion of southern France, and later at both Iwo Jima and Okinawa. And later, Texas would represent those older battleships in movies like Pearl Harbor, Flags of Our Fathers, and Letters from Iwo Jima. Today, the Texas is undergoing repairs and restoration in preparation for some large changes. Over 70 years, the ship has deteriorated and has had issues with taking on water, now requires constant pumping. In August, the battleship Texas Foundation took over operational control and maintenance of the ship, and is currently preparing to have it moved for major repairs to the ship's hull. With help from donors, the nonprofit foundation hopes to have the ship open to the public again by 2022, and updates on the restoration can be found at battleshiptexas.org as well as a store where patrons can donate to the efforts to modernize and restore this historic vessel for future generations. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.